Bene, con il professor Marco abbiamo visto quali sono eh, tutte le trappole dell'etnicizzazione di, di certi conflitti e il dramma che continua a vivere la Bosnia ma anche in un certo senso la Cipro per la soluzione della, del, suo, eh, del suo problema specifico. E vi presento adesso la, il secondo intervento di Karl Kostler che è senior researcher qui all'Istituto per il federalismo dell'EURAC, ha un PhD sia in diritto costituzionale comparato che in scienze politiche, si occupa di federalismo e studi sull'autonomia sull e si è occupato anche, è intervenuto come lettore in vari, in vari campi in diverse università eh, sul tema di, delle minoranze e modelli costituzionali in, eh, in ambito europeo, asiatico e eh, africano. E, ed è coautore del libro Comparative Federalism, Constitutional Arrangements in Case Law, eh, pubblicato proprio quest'anno dalla Hart Publishing di Oxford. La parola a, a Karl Kostler che ci eh, parlerà appunto della, eh, di modelli eh, comparati di autonomia. Grazie Mauro. Um, so after Joseph Marcos uh, conclusions the ball seems to be in my court now. So what is the role of federalism uh, for tricky situations in eth ethnoculturally diverse societies? Um, so I will look at challenges for constitutional design in such diverse societies and I will try to, to have a comparative perspective but on the other hand also to apply uh, these findings to the case of Rojava. So I will make some references to, uh, to Rojava. Of course people here for example in the front row they are very much more informed about the Rojava case so I look forward to the discussion afterwards and please correct me if I've got something wrong. But uh, these are the impressions that I have got from uh, some literature studies uh, on the Rojava case. So what does constitution mean uh, in the case of Rojava? Um, there is a social, so-called social contract that was um, adopted in 2014 when the PYD, so the party that controlled uh, three cantons in northern Syria, um, uh, declared de facto autonomous these territories from the state of Syria. And what is interesting also there in this uh, social contract, in Article 12 of this social contract, that it says that actually Rojava is a model for a future decentralized system of federal governance in Syria. So there is already, um, um, then there is already borne in mind a, a broader project in order to have uh, the autonomous region of northern Syria within a broader federal system of Syria as a whole. Uh, the next step then, was in 2016, when actually there was the declaration of a democratic federal system of Rojava, Northern Syria, in March 2016. And there was a, a major amendment of the social contract, which is still ongoing according to my information. So there is at the moment a draft social contract of 2016 uh, that already exists, but it's still uh, a document that is still in the making. So what is interesting here um, so why in constitution in inverted commas? So first, it's not called the constitution, it's called the social contract. So what does that imply? Of course, social contract, this uh, reminds us uh, quite quickly of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, of uh, the social contract, so his main uh, work that he's published. And of course, this would fit quite well because of course, Rousseau is the, the patron saint of direct democracy, which is, as we heard before, a major uh, element also of uh, uh, the Rojava model of democratic confederalism. On the other hand, constitution also in inverted commas because uh, the constitution was not recognized by the Assad government, so it's a constitution that is um, within uh, a territory of, of Syria, but it's not uh, recognized by the central government for quite obvious uh, reasons. So um, the question is then, um, what can federalism uh, contribute to a solution of, the con of, uh, of the, this quite tricky, of course, situation in Syria. And um, federalism implies two things, actually. So the most basic definition of federalism is both that it combines self-rule with shared rule. So there has to be, on the other hand, on the one hand, autonomy, 
On the other hand, also integration. So this autonomous territory also has to be integrated into the state as a whole. If, of course, um, there is no step further to full independence, and that is something that is explicitly uh, ruled out in the social contract. So uh, the social contract says it shall be a federal system, and also um, Özlem Dandrikulu said that before, that it's um, the, the three cantons, they are planned to remain within Syria. So the, in, the territorial integrity of Syria is not, uh, um, is not in, in, in discussion by this, um, uh, by this new model. So um, we have two dimensions. We have integration and, auto and autonomy uh, as the two hallmarks of uh, any federal system. So what has to be integrated? Because the integrative dimension is something that is, of course, missing at the moment because of the war situation and also because of the lack of recognition of the, of the Rojava social contract. Um, so the first thing is that actually there has to be at some point some legal integration. So there has to be uh, for any constitution that works within uh, a national constitution, within uh, the state of Syria, um, the regional constitution, let's call it that way, of uh, Rojava can only function um, um, within the limits of a national constitution. So that's in, in, in federal systems, usually have so-called homogeneity clauses which mandate that regional constitutions of the sub-national entities, they have to conform uh, with uh, the basic principles of the national constitution, because otherwise you have to avoid some conflict between the two constitutions. They have to be uh, somehow interrelated, but they cannot contradict each other. So usually um, this uh, obliges us, for example, in Germany, to uh, the, the, the regional constitution only to uh, follow some principles. For example, in Germany, this is uh, republicanism. Um, the lender of Germany, they have to be republican, they have to be democratic, they have to follow the social state principle and the rule of law principle, So, which is, of course, not very detailed. Of course, there are other federal systems, like, for example, in South Africa, where there are very detailed contents already um, um, stipulated in the national constitution, so that actually, and also procedures, so that actually the, the regional constitution, they have to follow these procedures in order to be adopted. And then actually it is the constitutional court of South Africa, so a national institution, which has to certify this constitution. So this is of course a, a top-down mechanism where um, the national level uh, can exert some control in order to make uh, the regional constitution comply with the national constitution. So um, this is a very important mechanism in order to uh, coordinate constitutions at two different levels, so at the regional level and at the national level. Another principle that is important in federal systems is uh, the supremacy, supremacy clause, which usually ensures, uh, and it ex exists in almost all federal systems, and it ensures the precedence of a national constitution or of all national law over regional law, over subnational law. For example, in the United States, it is um, even regulations and even ordinary laws of the national level, of the federal level, they prevail over the state constitutions. So there is, again, of course, precedence is given to the national level. And here it is quite interesting what the, the, the social charter says about that. Because the social charter turns that around. It says that Syrian legislation, so the national, national legislation, shall be applicable everywhere except where it contradicts provisions of this charter. So um, here, the, the charter, the regional constitution, prevails over uh, Syrian legislation, over national legislation. And uh, another interesting um, um, provision uh, foresees, for example, that in a conflict between laws, if you have a, a Syrian law, for example, for the future, of course, now, at, at the moment, in, in times of war, of course, uh, this is uh, uh, um, only a future situation that has to be taken into account. But um, in conflict between a national law and the regional law uh, of Rojava, it is the Supreme Constitutional Court of Rojava which will rule on the applicable law. So it is actually regional supremacy which is declared here, and it is the regional institution, the regional constitutional court, which shall uh, decide which uh, law is applicable in case of conflict. So these are quite extraordinary uh, affirmations in uh, the, the Rojava social con conflict. Of course, this might seem to you now quite hypothetical, but of course, once uh, um, there will be a federal Syria at one time, and within it, uh, the autonomous region of Rojava, 
uh, northern Syria, then this, this some, uh, will be some issues that have, will have to be sorted out with um, the Syrian government, whoever will be uh, at the helm of this government uh, in future, of course. Um, so this will be, at one time, this will be very practical to integrate uh, the two legal systems um, of uh, Rojava and of, um, of uh, Syria as a whole. So if you look now at the contents of the social contract, we already heard before that actually the, the social contract and the, the, the political system in Rojava um, is much more progressive regarding uh, many issues uh, than uh, the rest of Syria. For example, secularism, fami family law, which is based on the equality between men and women. For example, underage marriages, forced marriages are forbidden according to the social contract. Uh, whereas in other parts, of course, and in, in Syria um, up to now, um, uh, Sharia law and Sharia course, uh, courts are still in place. So there is a huge contrast, of course, between uh, between uh, the, the approaches of uh, northern Syria and Syria, on the other hand, on these two, on these issues. Another one is criminal justice, for example, where um, uh, northern Syria applies uh, a model of restorative justice. So this means that actually reconciliation is uh, given uh, precedence over punishment for the for the sake of uh, achieving social peace. So it's uh, reconciliation between. The perpetrator and the victim is more important than punishing uh, the, uh, the, uh, the criminal. So this is of course also something, and death penalty has been abolished. So this is of course also something that diverges where a point where um, modern Syria diverges very much from the rest of Syria. So there are very uh, uh, many contentious issues um, and there has to be uh, found uh, some solution in order to make, um, uh, in order to coordinate approaches uh, regarding these issues. Of course, there can be different approaches. For example, in the United States, you have the death penalty. In some states, you don't have it in the other. So this is precisely what federalism is also about. So you can also have constitutional autonomy. You can different have different constitutional systems at different levels of government. But of course, this divergence uh, uh, has to be within uh, certain limits. So um, another dimension of integration is um, institutional integration. So of course, this institutional integration, um, um, which uh, facilitates participation of regions at the national level, and also cooperation between the two levels of government, they are very important because they bind the institutions of the, of the, of the region to the national institutions. And there, more and more importance uh, in federal systems uh, do have intergovernmental bodies binding together executives. So there will, be, will have to be at some point also cooperation between the executives of uh, northern Syria, Rojava, northern Syria, with national executives uh, in order to um, uh, facilitate uh, the, the governance of complex issues. Because there are many issues that fall within uh, according to certain aspects uh, to the regional level and to other aspects to the national level. So there, regarding these shared competences, there has to be some coordination between the executives of, uh, of uh, northern Syria and Syria as a whole. So this was the first dimension, was the integrative dimension, which is, as I said, um, for the few, um, uh, currently not in place because of, the time, because of the war. But of course also it's not a given that after the war um, uh, there will be this integration because the, the, the federal system, the declaration of the federal system has been uh, rejected by both the Assad government and also by uh, the national coalition, so um, the main uh, uh, opposition uh, coalition. So even if they would take over after, uh, after the end of the war, it's not, uh, of course, a given that uh, the autonomy of Rojava, northern Syria, uh, will be accepted. So um, integration is still something that has to be achieved in the, in the future to some, to, to some extent. So let us now look at the autonomy dimension. And two things are important here. So two um, characteristics are important for, uh, and for autonomy in uh, an ethnocultural society, uh, diverse society to work. So first, it, sh it should be inclusive. And the second one, it should be decentralized. So there is a certain temptation uh, of what I would call hegemonic autonomy. Um, and what is this temptation about? 
So if a territory like Rojava, northern, northern Syria, of course, tries to get as much powers from the central government, there is also a certain, I would say, even inherent tendency to concentrate this power. And uh, many autonomous regions do not diffuse this power in, in, uh, by including internal minorities within this region or uh, local governments, which is then important also to diffuse this power at the, at the, at the level of the autonomous region. So I would like to quote here my slightly more famous compatriot Karl Renner, which is, uh, um, the quote is from 1899, so it is uh, quite, quite old, but it still captures this, um, this critique of uh, territorial autonomy that is understood only in terms of protecting uh, one group, so the majority in this, in this region. And it says, if you live in my territory, you are subject to my de domination, to my law and my language. It is the expression of domination, not of equal rights. The domination by the majority of the minority. And this is what, like Josef Marcus said before, this marginalization of the minority is uh, the, the nation state paradigm, which also, uh, of course, is uh, sometimes uh, prevailing at the regional level. So in this context, we can uh, speak of so-called nation regions uh, instead of nation states. And uh, so autonomous regions have to uh, attempt to, to fall into this trap and not to be uh, hegemonic and to include uh, internal minorities as well. So let us first look at, the, at, at, at inclusive autonomy. Um, so what is important here? Why is, uh, um, the, why is the marginalization of minorities at the regional level a bad thing? Why is not majority rule a good thing per se? Because even if uh, it is the majority, the, the democratic majority that has the power, power tends to corrupt, and if power is absolute, it tends to uh, corrupt absolutely, as a famous British uh, liberal uh, in the 19th century put it. So there have to be some checks and balances uh, for the exercise of, of power, also at the regional level, not only at the, at the national level. And certain scholars and uh, theorists, such as uh, James Madison, for example, um, were of the opinion that actually in smaller territories, in regions, there is even an, a, a, a greater potential, a greater uh, danger of oppression, uh, of a tyranny of the majority than in, at the national level. So we have, we have to look also in the, at, the, at, the, at the regional level for some checks and balances um, for um, with regard to the power of the regional majority. So um, there are, of course, many different devices for that. I would like to mention just one of them, because Josef Marco also mentioned that before, the mechanism of power sharing. So in his presentation, it was mainly about power sharing at the national level. Of course, in Bosnia, it, is, it also happens at the, at the regional level, so at the level of the two entities as well. And um, what is this power sharing about? It is about participation in mostly the the legislative power and or the executive power uh, of different groups. So through special voting procedures, for example, regarding uh, lawmaking or uh, the cabinet position uh, in, in the regional government. So we heard before that actually the track record, at least on the Balkans, uh, of power sharing is rather dire. And um, so there are um, they're, they're, um, it's not very encouraging, this uh, experience there. But of course, there are also other examples, for example, in Northern Ireland, to a certain extent also in South Tyrol, where these mechanisms have functioned better than in, uh, on the Balkans. And um, so uh, according to my view, there are two things that are important here. So of course, power sharing does not work if it is imposed from the outside. So uh, power sharing just works if the groups on the spot if they, in, if they are really willing to share power. Otherwise, if it does not grow from within, it does not work. So it's, it cannot be imposed from the outside. So this is, of course, something that is, is not a, a legal issue. It's not a conceptual issue. This is just a, a context factor, of course. But there is also, of course, the constitutional design of such mechanisms are very important. We heard before that uh, the, the vital interest mechanism in Bosnia was invoked uh, as many as 800 times. But of course, in Northern Ireland, uh, the number is much lower, and so there has to be some, some uh, balance, of course. You cannot have a vital interest, you have, cannot qualify each and every topic as a vital interest where uh, a small group of uh, parliamentarians 
has, the, has a veto right, but you have to calibrate it um, uh, in a more sensitive way and really figure out maybe there are some um, uh, uh, really vital, really vital issues regarding to which the veto power makes sense and also uh, what are the quoras in order to invoke this uh, veto power. So of course in that sense in, in, uh, in Bosnia uh, it was really um, these 800 times really symbolized already that actually veto powers, the special voting procedures uh, have entailed uh, a blockade of the political process, right? On the other hand, if um, veto powers or such mechanisms are used in a much more limited way, they can also uh, enhance the acceptance of political decisions because it's not only the majority then that has voted on, the, on them, but uh, a two-thirds majority, or even if it is a veto, different groups have given their support for, uh, for a particular decision. So uh, there has to be uh, a, a balance has to be struck in terms of institutional design of such mechanisms. So such regional power sharing mechanisms, we have mentioned it already before, South Tyrol has a history of such uh, mechanisms since uh, uh, as the, the autonomy statute of 1972 has enshrined such mechanisms um, um, already a long time ago. But there has to be a trend later on since the 1990s, especially with uh, Bosnia, um, a, a rather negative experience and with the Belfast agree Agreement in 1998 a slightly more positive experience and so that in also in, in research regional power sharing has uh, received more and more attention since then. So uh, this is about inclusive uh, decision making of course. Another dimension of inclusion is uh, identity politics and that is of course very important because any constitution or social contract, whatever you call it, does not only have a regulative function, so it regulates power, it regulates decision making. That was what constitutions do. They enable and disable uh, uh, decision making. So this is the regulative function. But there is also the constitutive function, which means that they are very important for uh, the, the constitution, for the, for the creation of the identity of the constitutional sub subject. So often the preambles they begin with we the people but who is the people who is the people that is important and there is a very important identity and symbolic uh, uh, dimension that is there and what is interesting here is uh, that uh, the 2016 preamble of the social contract is more open than that uh, than, the, than the preamble in 2014 because in 2014 it was a list of uh, different ethnic groups um, um, so it was also um, recognize that actually there is more, there are not only Kurds, but there are other uh, groups as well. But now it is not only ethnic identities, it's also territorial identities, it's also religious identities, and it also says, and others, and other groups as well. So it is an open list, it's an open preamble, and which reflects uh, um, a, a multi-identity perception of uh, Rojava northern, northern Syria. And another um, important identity relevant issue is of course the very name Rojava Northern Syria. So there was a recent decision now in uh, December 2016 of this constituent assembly to uh, call, the, uh, to call the, the federal system, the federal system of Northern Syria and not anymore Rojava Nor Northern Syria. Because Rojava is uh, a Kurdish word, right? So that's the first thing, why it was deemed exclusive with regard to the minority groups. It's a Kurdish language uh, term. The second one is that Rojava means uh, West or Western. Uh, so it's Western Kurdistan. So it is, of course, it alludes to the historic region of Kurdistan. And it's not northern, the north of Syria, but uh, the point of reference is Kurdistan and not Syria. So there was a huge discussion about this issue and uh, I'm quite sure there's also within this room there are many different uh, opinions on that issue. Uh, I just have a, an interesting and very famous, I guess, uh, picture here. So that is a uh, press conference, some uh, of the Constituent Assembly, someone came out and, uh, and encircled the term Rojava with the heart. So obviously to Kurdish people, of course, Rojava is very close to their heart and it's a very uh, a emotional issue, of course. So these symbolic identity issues, they are very, very important, of course. So this is, of course, um, uh, a dilemma that is not easy to solve. But um, um, here, obviously, 
uh, a move uh, was, um, uh, was initiated towards a more inclusive um, perception of the identity. So um, which diversity to include is an important thing then. So what I have uh, talked about so far is of course ethnocultural diversity. And um, um, we had said before, uh, said before already that actually um, according to the identity dimension and also the decision making at least at the local level um, there is co-chairing uh, of, of various committees and that the local, in local councils there are, um, according to my information, uh, Kurdish, Arabs and Assyrians or Assyrian or Armenian Christians are represented in these uh, leading, um, so mostly it's, it's three people from the different groups leading uh, the, the, the local councils. So um, uh, there seems to be um, inclusiveness with regard to in, uh, ethnocultural groups. Another important dimension, of course, women's participation in uh, political life. And here, um, the social contract um, foresees that in all government bodies and agencies, 40% uh, have of the of the representatives have been have to be male or female, at least at least 40%, of course. Um, uh, so this quota system, of course, also ensures uh, some uh, some more representation for women and if uh, of women, and if you. Um, go back to the picture, you have seen a lot of women actually uh, at this press conference. So the role of women uh, in northern Syria is certainly um, uh, um, increased uh, with regard to other parts of, uh, of, uh, of the Syrian state. There's no question about that. Um, another issue is, of course, ideological, political ideological diversity, pluralism. And here the picture seems to be a bit less clear. So. Um, one thing is that, of course, the, the prevailing uh, ideology of democratic confederalism um, is inspired by a singular leader, uh, Abdullah Öcalan. It is, um, of course, then diffused uh, within society, but it's not actually something that is really has grown in a bottom-up process from these grassroots assemblies. It seems to me, but uh, of course, uh, it's interesting to hear different opinions about it, that it's uh, diffused from top down. Uh, the ideology, ideology, and that is, of course, um, interesting in terms of ideological pluralism. And, of course, um, there is uh, this political rift within the Syrian Kurd, uh, Kurdish uh, community between uh, the PYD on the one hand, as well as the one main camp, and uh, the Kurdish National Council, where there was once this uh, Kurdish Supreme, uh, Su Supreme Committee, which was formed by both political camps. And then, of course, um, um, this, uh, this, uh, the Kurdish National Council withdrew from this uh, Kurdish Supreme Committee and um, actually was then dissolved so that um, the Kurdish National Council has uh, to a large extent disappeared from the political life in, in northern Syria. Of course, there are uh, different, there is a blame game going on, of course. Um, um, uh, PYD people say that actually um, uh, KNC um, people, they broke promises and, uh, and evade cooperation and vice versa as well. So um, it would be interesting to hear your opinion about that as well. But the fact is that there was a boycott of the Kurdish National Council of the local elections and they were also not uh, involved in the, in the uh, drafting of the, of the new social contract of the, in, the, in the constituent assembly. So there, there is this political rift between two main political camps in uh, northern Syria. So just to um, one minute regarding the last dimension of autonomy, which seems to me important. So autonomy has to be, in order to be non-hegemonic, it has to be decentralized. So power has to be diffused also to, um, to local governments. And traditionally, federal systems are uh, premised on a dual notion of having of course, having a, a federal level and having a subnational level. So, according to a traditional view, the local governments were mere creatures of uh, of the, the state, so of the, the subnational level, in order to exercise a part of its power. So, they were mere subdivisions. There is something going on, or there has been a trend going on uh, after World War II that actually local autonomy has has to be so a third level within a federal system has to be given much more recognition, and much, um, um, much more room, especially in ethnoculturally diverse societies that are in a process of democratization. 
And why is that the case? So for example, Spain is one example where uh, this emphasis was placed uh, on, on local governments even before the formation of the autonomous communities, the regions. So the local uh, the elections were held before. And also in India, for example, Mahatma Gandhi placed a huge emphasis on the local level as well, because the local, for two reasons actually. The local level first was seen as, uh, as a bulwark against centralization and as a return of the uh, dictatorial centralized regime. And the second issue is that actually it was, given, was seen as giving room to pragmatic cooperation. Because at the local level, you, have, uh, you are usually, uh, you have to deal with uh, basic services for households and so on. And this uh, can give room for non-ideological pragmatic cooperation within different groups. So there are very tangible problems, not very symbolically, ideologically loaded problems at the local level. And this might, um, um, might nurture some pragmatism and some cooperation between different groups. So let's have at the end uh, a look at, the, at the, the situation in northern Syria. As we said before, the local councils, they are founded on a policy of uh, decentralization. And so where there is a strong local element, of course, in the ideology of democratic conf confederalism, it follows a bottom-up logic so that there uh, have to be these local councils at the, at, the, at the municipal level and they then form associations and they are joined together in, uh, in, in confederations going up there. Of course, there rests still the question of the ideological pluralism because that is of course not only relevant at the, the regional level, at the level of northern Syria, but also ideological pluralism has to be in place at the local level as well. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'll stop here and uh, look forward to the discussion. Bene, con uh, l'intervento di Karl Kostler siamo già entrati nella, nella questione eh, diciamo chiave del, di questo convegno che è il funzionamento del confederalismo democratico ed è il, uh, il tema che affronteremo nella prossima sessione. Adesso facciamo una, una pausa, vi chiediamo di essere precisi perché altrimenti alla fine non ci sa, non, potrebbe non esserci spazio per una discussione con il pubblico e i relatori. Ci vediamo fra esattamente 30 minuti. Grazie.